schools nationwide to resume on April 27th. PMVs to operate, roadside markets and betel nut band. And Nakia implements strategies to contain swine fever. This is the National MTV News with Helen Sayer. Good evening and thanks for joining us for Saturday's news. Students in Papua New Guinea are expected to stay away from classes for another three weeks until after the Easter holiday. The additional weeks away from school is a government directive under the declared state of emergency, which has been extended for a further two months. Prime Minister James Marape made this announcement when outlining a few orders under the SOE. A review on the resumption of classes for the 2020 academic year will be conducted after the 27th of April. This will apply for all education institutions from elementary to universities, both private and government schools. But for now, head teachers and principals have been advised that the school holidays will extend for another three weeks. Schools, we will have an extension of the uh, stay at home for up to uh, the expiry of first term holiday and within the next two weeks uh, we will take stock and assess and see whether we will prepare our education system to live with a change in uh, lifestyle in as far as covert lifestyle uh, readiness or preparedness is concerned. And if there is no uh, presence of coronavirus still in us and we feel that the schools can respond to living with a danger and allowing our students to be back in school, then we will make a decision within the next two weeks. A statement released by the Education Department states that a total of nine weeks of classes will be affected because of this pandemic. While initial announcements indicated that classes will resume on the 1st of June, the government will make further announcements after proper consultation with the Education Department. Taking into account national examinations for grades 8, 10 and 12. But as I speak, I am passing uh, notice to all our educational institutions uh, throughout the country, all our educational providers that we give extension of the holidays. As we know, the first time holiday is due at the end of this week, and so we're allowing them to remain at home. And before the 27th of April, we will take addition as to our future of education in our country in respect to what is happening globally in the region and in our country. Thakla Gunga, National MTV News. The 2020 school calendar for elementary, primary and secondary schools have been affected because of the coronavirus pandemic. While accepting the government's decision, PNGTA General Secretary Ugwa Lubumuana said there should be some degree of teaching and learning taking place to help students. Schools globally have been shut down because of COVID-19. Schools in Papua New Guinea, however, are expected to commence on 27th of April, 2020. This means students will not be learning anything in the classroom for five weeks. The PNG 2020 school calendar has its own set of events guided by the Education Department. All these events have now been affected because of the state of emergency. In a school year, we teach we teach, okay, every one and a half week or two weeks, we complete one unit. Then we go to another unit. And then we test it and we continue. So we complete a set of syllabus as time is programmed. So definitely this last two weeks and the next two weeks, definitely it's going to put a, a month set back uh, minus the holiday week. Uh, it will put a three week setback of uh, loss of school work. PNGTA National General Secretary Igualubu Moana says it is evident that students' education will be affected, but also supported the government's decision on the unprecedented circumstance. Mr. Moana says should an outbreak happen, schools will be the first ones to be affected because of the constant interactions between students and teachers. Therefore, the call for an extra three weeks was vital. We will continue to support the government's initiative to ensure 
that the nation, the children, and its people are protected. So I ask our teachers, we feel that the safety and the health of our teachers who are very closely on daily basis interact with our children. Their health and that of their families and that of their children and the people in the communities they serve must be protected. Under the extended declared state of emergency, the additional three weeks is a directive from the national government. We'll prepare our education system to live with a change in uh, lifestyle in as far as covert lifestyle uh, readiness or preparedness is concerned. And if there is no uh, presence of coronavirus still in us and we feel that the schools can respond to living with a danger and allowing our students to be back in school, then we will make a decision within the next two weeks. PNGTA, however, has also called on the Department of Education to lay down some protocols to allow teaching and learning to continue in the country as soon as 27th of April is due. Should there be no case identified in the next three weeks, there should be some degree of teaching and learning taking place for the sake of education for the children. Michelle Steven, National MTV News. National airline carrier Air New Guinea will resume domestic sector flights starting Monday 6th of April. The decision to recommence domestic services follows advice from the national government following the 14-day lockdown. However, flights will be reduced for all sectors and depending on demand as well. In addition to the resumption of domestic flights in the country, the airline is rolling out safeguard measures on all domestic flights to avoid the chance of COVID-19 being carried and further enhance requirements in the border provinces of Vanemo Sundown Province and Daro in Western Province. This will include heightened security and health checks at these airports. On Monday onwards, we are working to ensure flights uh, returned to normal operation in, our, in as far as our domestic flight and travel is concerned. We're working to ensure that uh, the local land transport and sea transport are opening up, but with a control sort of element in between province to province and between town to town so that we take stock of who is traveling. And some of those control measures will come into play. And I ask the nation to bear with us as the controller. Uh, take us through today and the next few days to ensure our citizens live with the reality knowing the risk we continue to face that corona can come in and with no proper management supervision control and oversight it can get out of proportion in our face in a statement released by new guinea's acting ceo bruce alabasta domestic operations will resume but build up to its normal schedule once demand picks up hence travelers will notice a combination of services upgrade equipment on certain sectors while others will be downgraded the statement elucidates that for the first day medang wiwek and vanimo services will be combined direct flights to lay will be reduced to one instead of four services garoka will have one instead of two services montagan will have three instead of five services and Rabal will have two instead of four services. On the international sector, whilst New Guinea continues flights from the three designated ports of Brisbane, Cairns and Singapore, these are only to bring in urgent freight such as medicines, medical equipment, essential personnel, spare parts and to carry outbound passengers. No passengers have been carried into PNG. New Guinea's port most to Brisbane flights on Tuesdays and Fridays is retimed to depart at 10.30 a.m. instead of 6.15 a.m. and the schedule will be reviewed on a weekly basis. Anit Kora, National MTV News. The National Capital District Task Force for COVID-19 has lifted the ban on public motor vehicles but has kept the ban on roadside markets and betel nut. The task force team says shops and main markets will remain open but strict social distancing measures will be enforced by the task force team through the police and defence force personnel. The NCD COVID-19 Task Force team headed by Governor of NCD, Powers Parkop, today made announcements on the city's contingency plans for the two months extension of the state of emergency by the national government. Shops and markets will remain open with public motor vehicles to be on the road again. Schools are expected to resume towards the end of April. The schools will be closed until 27th of April. Main markets will continue to operate with enforcement of social distancing 
and hand washing. Better not trading. It won't be allowed. PMV should be allowed to operate, but with social distancing. But there will be restrictions on PMVs and measures of social distancing to be adhered by the public in PMVs and in public areas. If you operate not 25 passengers but 15, keep social distancing. So at our level, we are not going to stop you from operating, but if you operate now, you don't keep social distancing. Now, something blow was your hand, blow passenger, we will arrest you. The ban on roadside markets will still be in effect, including the ban on betel nut to continue. I know a lot of people depend on it, generate income, but our practice of chewing and spitting, it's totally contradict to the basic information or uh, the, the, the way in which we are going to uh, stop the spread of the uh, virus. NCD Governor Powers Pakob says the time for awareness has ended with a wide range of information from media and the government already reaching most of the population in the city and now NCD will be enforcing the social distancing rule. Monday onwards the police will help us to enforce, the defense force if they come on, on board they will help us to enforce, our reserve police will help to enforce in the markets, in the public place Everywhere we are going to start the enforcement. Pakob said the public must leave us though the virus is already on our shores and stressed that adhering to restrictions put in place by the task force team is in itself the only cure. The world says that there is no cure, but in PNG, you must talk about some eager cure. We have a cure for this uh, COVID-19 and the cure is only two words. Harim talk! Harim talk! Fidel Sukina, National MTV News. Minister for Communication and Information Technology, Timothy Masio, has stressed that information related to the COVID-19 pandemic coming from the government through recognized media outlets, government-administered websites and social media pages is trusted information. Correct information channeled down to the community from the government is of utmost importance to combat the COVID-19 virus. Having correct information from government is what the Minister for Communication and Information Technology, Timothy Matthew, stressed in an interview with MTV this afternoon. Any uh, awareness materials that's going out, uh, health uh, department, they, they release those. Of course, with the help of uh, w, WHO, and um, and then it is our job in our sector to disseminate that information. Uh, what uh, we don't want to do is to confuse our people with all kinds of information. And and so I use this time to again call on our people to always check your sources of where you are getting your information. Matthew says that the government is doing its best to use mass media to drive key messaging and awareness on the COVID-19 pandemic in the country. Information uh, coming out, you know, from social media, you know, uh, some of those information is not trusted. So, um, uh, as a government, uh, we are using our government uh, uh, channels in terms of radio and television. And of course, we are, we are very happy to, to, uh, to be supported by the newspapers uh, in the country. He added that the way forward is to have information on the awareness translated to Pidgin and other languages to help communicate effectively the information to the levels of society. I was very vocal uh, in the committee that we should start, uh, you know, working on the leaflets, the browsers, pamphlets, and this must be uh, written in Tokpisin, in Motu, and in some provinces where they use one language, like East New Britain, they use the Kwanwa language. And in Enga province, you know, they speak one language. We have one class of people who is the educated people. We can give them the hard stuff. And then we come down to the working class people. We can give them, you know, um, something that is uh, good for them. But when we go to the villages and we go to the hamlets and we go to the mountains, you know, go to the islands and we go and see people in these areas, we give them what they can take. Philly Sukina National M TV News. You're watching National M TV News. We'll be back with more after these messages. Stay with us. Welcome back. 
Western Governor Taboy Awiyoto and member for North Fly James Donald are concerned over not having enough personal protective equipment in the province in case the coronavirus reaches the province. The province borders with Australia and Indonesia. However, it is not equipped to stop the virus and therefore needs the support of the national government. Having allocated 5.5 million kina for awareness programs for COVID-19, Western province leaders are still concerned that the province does not have enough PPEs in case the virus reaches the province. Northfly member James Donald says the province is ready. However, nursing staff in the province would need assistance on how to handle the virus if detected. I am sorry, we are not ever prepared yet to tackle suppose one plant disease or confirmed case come up on the ground, ever had. Now we will run for uh, all these gears, all these something. So that's why we've been asking. As a country, we are unable to contain some possibility to take him now yet. All how sick workman, in no plenty. Me blood for it yet, or some time sick and become. All got a man by in on up, in up long, contain him. All got a man by now. And we concern the Inno Miplata, so whole country, nursing, uh, staff, work battle, housing, and legally to us. He says right now all the leaders of the province are working together to target hotspot areas, particularly the borders of Australia and Indonesia. So, which means all the factory and all the money around the PPE, and even country Papua New Guinea has got no stock. What we've been receiving is just a hand gloves or a set of nose masks or so. Now got a nest, now got a man by work here. Yeah. All you know got is a PPE. Now I'm big it. So what we've delivered in the last uh, two days ago or three days ago is just two or uh, four sets of uh, eleven sets of um, uh, nose mask, na sample hand gloves, na kind or something that some people go give me. Member South fly me to plago tromelo daruna kam. He is calling on the national government to seriously support the efforts put in place by the provincial government. Western Governor Taboy Awiyoto says the province does not have enough funds to build testing and isolation facilities. We like a health facility, especially testing kits, to test any person of interest in relation to coronavirus. We need to also need money to also put up a isolation facility in Daru and Kiunga, where we believe these two are the, going to be the main, uh, hot, not hot spots, but place for people to come and get uh, support in terms of uh, medicine in the event that the virus come into Western province. So we need to have a facility in Daru for isolation and containment, and also in Kiunga too as well. Meanwhile, the 5.5 million kina allocated will assist police and defence personnel to the borders of Australia and Indonesia and to carry out COVID-19 awareness in the province and to maintain law and order. Godwin Eki, National MTV News. As a way of containing the African swine fever, roadblocks will be established in Western Highlands province to stop people from transporting pigs or pork products to other provinces. Agriculture Minister John Simon said this is part of their containment plan to stop the virus from spreading to other provinces. Teams from the National Agriculture Quarantine and Inspection Authority will also be in the province to monitor the situation. Living a while the country has taken steps to address the COVID-19 pandemic, Nakia will also be taking steps to address the African swine fever in Southern Highlands province. People have been advised not to carry pigs and pork products to other provinces, and a roadblock will be established in Western Highlands province to monitor the movement of pigs and pork products. After you slaughter the pig, do not bring it down to Hagen and to Chiwaka, to uh, Chimbu, to... Uh to lay, you don't have to do that. Because if you do that, then it will sp continue to spread out. So our team will be in, um, in Hagen, in those uh, roadblocks, to make sure those meats, all Abu Solino, uh, Ino Karim come down. 
Since last month, over 300 pigs have already died from this disease in Kagua Erave district of Southern Highlands province. People in affected areas have also been advised to start slaughtering their pigs. The minister said people can eat meat from the pigs they slaughtered but are not allowed to eat meat from dead pigs. All pig blood you blood stop long him. You blood must kill him. Na kill him na cook him kaka emo right. But you don't have sick lord isla. <coughs> but suppose piggy die penis. Em to sol now you no get keke. The minister adding that teams from Nakia will be traveling to Western Highlands province to carry out their containment plans. He further called on the people of Southern Highlands province to work together with the team to help contain the spread of the virus. So, me play by time law, stop him long again, I go to the backside. He go to him long uh, Southern Highlands, go long Engan, uh, go long Ella province. So, try and make him sick, you know, again, come down the same by come long again, uh, come long. Nakia Managing Director Joel Alu adding that the teams will be in the province to carry out delimiting exercise. He said once they are able to identify the extent of the spread, they will be able to contain it. The team that will be sending from Port Mosby to Haken, where they will meet team up with the team in Haken as well as Goroka. And they will be going to the Southern Islands to what they will do first of all is to, to demarcate, delimit and survey, they call it the limit survey to find out the extent of the spread. When we are able to establish the extent of the spread, then we can be able to pin down that particular area uh, so that uh, the other areas are not affected. Rayon Lakingu National, MTV News. Middle Fly MP Roy Biyama has named a secondary school in his district after Prime Minister James Marape. Marape's secondary school will bring to the district more education opportunities for the young generation. Dormitories and classrooms are already complete, however there is still more work that needs to be done. MP Biyama says this has been a dream for many years and now it is reality. The Prime Minister has made a commitment of one million kina towards the completion of the school. According to MP Biyama, Marape Secondary is expected to commence classes next year. Thirteen organizations have been successful in their applications to receive women empowerment grants. The U.S. Embassy in Port Moresby announced a $75,000 U.S. dollar funding support for the Ambassador's Small Grants Program. The program will fund specific projects by local non-profit, non-governmental, community-based civil society organizations in PNG, Vanuatu and Solomon Islands. It seeks to increase community-based capacity to improve the welfare of women and girls in the three island nations. The program encourages projects that promote partnerships among two or more local organizations for a common goal. This includes young women as project implementers and will take in the use of social media and demonstrate innovative ways to address women's issues. Turning overseas, Spain is one of the worst hit countries in the world with the nation's death toll now over 10,000 from the coronavirus. Hospitals in at least part of the country's 17 regions are at or very near their ICU bed limits and medical workers make up 14% of those infected. In Italy, the number of deaths continue to grow even as the rate of new infections begins to slow. Italian police salute a convoy of army vehicles transporting bodies. Another day, another 756 people die. The grim toll is now nearing 11,000. In Naples, a priest leads mass from the roof of a church. The neighborhood congregation gathers on balconies to pray. In Cristo Gesù, nostro Signore, amen. Police deploy their eye in the sky to check on people disobeying the lockdown. And on the ground, the police are also deploying water cannons, normally used to disperse protesters, but now to sanitise the streets. A quarter of a million face masks are flown into Venice, where the health system is collapsing under the strain. So many doctors and nurses have been infected, 
The government is appealing to healthcare workers to travel to the north and help. More than 50 doctors have died and at least 4,000 nurses have the virus. The North is still in a deep crisis. We have a shortage of uh, specialised people in health sector because they have been uh, contaminated. Spain has been in lockdown for over two weeks, but that's been tightened further with only essential workers allowed out of their homes. Feeling better this week? Yes, I've stopped crying. <laughs> Australians Natalia Lang and Mandy Keelor have called Spain home for 14 years. Now life is very different. It's not a situation like that you can talk to anyone and someone give you advice on how to, how to handle it. It's just a matter of we're all looking at each other going, wow, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Funeral homes can barely keep up with demand. We are multiplying by six the number of normal uh, services we perform in that area. But the nation's health officials say it's not all bad news. The increase in cases was about 20 per cent and since social distancing measures began it's 12 per cent. With the toll climbing around the world, France and the US have reached an unwanted milestone, recording more than 3,000 deaths. <laughs> Cheering continues from windows across Europe for the doctors and nurses who've become heroes. 12,000 healthcare workers in Spain are now ill with the virus, but they're not being taken for granted. National MTV News continues with more stories making headlines overseas when we come back. Welcome back. America's public health emergencies are said to direct all residents to wear face masks in public places. The move would match measures in Hong Kong, South Korea and Taiwan, all with low numbers of cases and deaths, adding the debates in the West where research shows how fast sneeze droplets can spread. America's two biggest cities, the latest to direct residents to cover up. It could be a scarf. Uh, it could be something you create yourself at home. We don't want you to use uh, the kinds of masks that our first responders need. We're going to have to get used to, you know, seeing each other like this. A study on how fast sneeze droplets travel, adding more weight to a global debate on whether wearing a mask can help prevent coronavirus transmission. According to the World Health Organization, the infection can be spread to anyone up to a metre away. The New Zealand government, among many others, advises that two metres can be considered a safe distance. But Research in the US shows coughing can project small droplets up to six metres and sneezing can go up to eight metres. However, there isn't any definitive proof that coronavirus can spread that far. The scientists involved say masks could reduce the risk. It's important to not be overconfident when wearing them as a way to protecting oneself against the inhalation of those, of all those droplets. It's more about protecting others from our own exhalations. Our government only recommends face masks for people who are sick or on healthcare front lines. But New Zealand's not immune from rising public demand, prompting offers from a number of Kiwi manufacturers to repurpose to make masks. Certainly having a bigger supply with local manufacturers means that those hospital grade face masks can go to the right people um, and there'll be plenty to go around for the general public. Last night on One News we saw how some people are attempting to make their own. It's not something our health ministry recommends. Experts stressing if you do wear one, you can still transmit and it doesn't make you immune. The pandemic has ended the life of first responders in the United States who faced increasing complicated risks because of the virus. Police and fire departments have warned supplies for first responders are running dangerously low. One fire official here in Washington told us they're hearing estimates that tens of thousands of people in this city could get sick from coronavirus. This is, of course, stressing the resources of firefighters and EMTs here in Washington and across the country. In fact, just the precautions that they have to take to go on one given call are jarring. In New York, frontline EMTs and paramedics face an avalanche of calls. When I left Brookdale Hospital, they, uh, it was about maybe 
15 ambulances outside waiting to be triaged. An EMT in Queens says it's overwhelming. Call volume, it's it's just ridiculous. It's one after another after another. Most of the station is out with symptoms, but the ones that are still working, we're so tired. We are extremely tired. We're working over 16 hours a day. So many patients hospitalized, they are spilling over. The hospital doesn't have any beds, and they're using our stretcher to work up the patient, and the patient's on a ventilator at the moment and I can't get the stretcher back. And the dangers are real. On Tuesday, Israel Tolentino, an EMT firefighter in Passaic, New Jersey, died of complications of coronavirus. While it's not clear how he got infected, his fire department is considering it a line of duty death. In the nation's capital, first responders are also decimated and bracing for an onslaught. Our firefighter EMTs and paramedics are used to handling emergencies that they can see and feel, whether it's running into a fire ground or treating somebody in cardiac arrest or an asthma patient. Uh, this is an unknown enemy that we're, we haven't dealt with before, and that definitely raises the anxiety level. Paramedic and D.C. Firefighters Union Rep Joe Paparello told us about 10% of D.C.'s paramedics and firefighter EMTs are out of commission tonight, having tested positive for coronavirus or under quarantine. With potentially tens of thousands of cases on the horizon for Washington, Paparello and his teams are telling D.C. residents, only call 911 if it's an emergency, like difficulty breathing, not just because you think you might have coronavirus. On the call, describe all your symptoms so they can prepare. Meet the paramedics outside if you can, so they don't have to come in your house. And wear a mask if you have one, to protect them from your germs. I think our members' biggest fear is bringing the virus home to our families. If a responding team in D.C. arrives at a home with a suspected case of coronavirus, Paparello says, each responder has to take an extra few seconds to don a mask, face shield, gown, and foot covers. He doesn't believe there's enough of a delay to compromise a patient's safety. But sometimes, it's out of a responder's courageous hands. New York paramedic Anthony Almahera gives a gut-wrenching account of trying to comfort a coronavirus victim's husband while social distancing. When he realized that his wife had passed away and we worked her up and did everything we could and then afterwards I went to tell him and normally I would put my arm around him but uh, yeah. this time around I had to keep distance and I watched this man's grief come over him, his anger, his sadness. For the first time in my 17 year career, I, I went back inside and to the truck and I cried. The anxieties and the taxing of resources are piling up across the country for first responders and that doesn't even include the simple steps that they all have to take each day to prevent coronavirus. At this station, a truck like this one has to be wiped down two or three times a day and after a given call where there might be symptoms of coronavirus, Coronavirus, an ambulance has to be taken to a separate site and disinfected with some kind of a decontaminating spray. Still in the United States, a rural county in southwestern Georgia has emerged as an unlikely virus hotspot with almost one in four of the 5,000 cases. State health officials believe it may have started with two funerals in the city of Albany. Emel Murray has endured a lot of pain over the past 30 days. Back on February 29th, hundreds of family and friends came to the small Georgia city of Albany to say goodbye to Andrew Mitchell, the man that she loved for the past 20 years. After several hours of crying and hugging each other, Murray started feeling sick. That night, my mother went to bed. She had a fever. We didn't even know it at the time. The 75-year-old was presumably one of the first in Albany to be exposed to the coronavirus. She was hospitalized, but not immediately tested. Other members of their family, their friends who attended the funeral, began to get sick too. And since then, several have died. I knew things that we're living in the last days. I knew things were going to be bad, but until it hits you, you know, that's when you're really just like, wow, it's here and it's now. A positive test on March 10th from a visitor who attended the funeral tipped the Phoebe Putney Health System off. At least 20 of the first patients to be diagnosed with coronavirus in Albany had attended one of two funerals in town. A second trip to the hospital confirmed Murray was one of them. From there, the cases jumped. Two the first day, it was six the next day, it was eight the next day, and it just began to cascade from that point. So far, more than 5,400 people have been infected with the virus in Georgia. More than 175 have died, nearly a quarter of those from the Albany area. As the virus rips through their rural community, for so many here, it's overwhelming. 
With us being in a small city, um, we, we're, not, we're not New York, but we are still impacted. And when you look at the percentages of our population that's impacted, I mean, that's still a significant number. Scott Steiner, the CEO of Phoebe Putney Health Systems, which serves Southwest Georgia, says they blew through six months worth of personal protective equipment in just one week. We've got 4,500 uh, warriors. That's what these people, they're flat out warriors that do this day in and day out. They put themselves at risk. They run into the fire when other people might run away from it. Some of the hospital's office workers have now traded their computers for sewing machines, making mask covers, an attempt to extend the use to PPEs. But even still, Steiner says they only have enough right now for less than two weeks. We have seen that, that curve go up. Uh, we have not seen it bend over yet. The governor deployed the National Guard to set up additional intensive care units. We have shipped necessary supplies and plan more shipments based on the needs of Phoebe Putney system in the future. As for Murray, she's back home now, but her daughter says, like many in this family and small community, the road to recovery will be long. It's hard watching her suffer. The statewide stay-at-home order in Georgia goes into effect on Friday, but they've been dealing with the effects of this virus for weeks now here in Albany. I asked the hospital CEO if he thought that they had turned a corner, if things were starting to get better. He simply took a deep breath, looked down, and told me, no, they've likely not seen the worst of it just yet. Russia sent a cargo plane to New York this week loaded with crucial medical supplies. Donald Trump called it a very nice gesture, even though the United States may have paid for some of them. It is also raising questions about why. Why would the Russians part with equipment they may need themselves? You know it's getting bad when even Russia sends in urgent medical aid. This giant plane load of essential supplies from Moscow, including testing and protective gear, is a humanitarian gesture, says the Kremlin, one for which New York air traffic control, at least, seemed grateful. Romeo, Fashion, Fashion 8460 Heavy, we sincerely thank you for all the assistance you are bringing in. Contact Kennedy Tower 119.1. Have a good day. 119.1, you're welcome, back. But help like this is rarely free. In this case, it seems the US government paid for part of it. The Kremlin says at least half was donated by Russia. Question is, what does it get in return? It's odd because Russia is currently struggling itself with the coronavirus pandemic. The streets of the capital deserted amid an enforced lockdown. And while official casualty figures are relatively low, the Kremlin is slowly admitting their problem is far from under control. In fact, the Russian president has just appeared on state television, extending the national lockdown through April. The threat still remains. According to virologists, the peak of the epidemic in the world has not yet been passed, including in our country. Hardly the time, say critics, to be sending much-needed medical resources abroad. Wouldn't it be nice if we actually got along with Russia? Wouldn't that be, wouldn't that be nice? But Moscow may have other considerations. It wants painful American sanctions lifted, imposed for its meddling in the US election. And its military interventions in Syria and Ukraine. Humanitarian aid to the US could obscure its misbehavior elsewhere. But even if it doesn't, this potent image of Russia helping one of the world's most powerful countries may be the Kremlin's richest reward. Up next, some sporting updates in Shukai Sports. Stay with us. Sports. Welcome to Shukai Sports. A handful of the wealthiest and top clubs in England's Premier League have accepted financial aid from the government to help pay wages during this pandemic. Critics say it shouldn't because of the huge revenue they earn from the league's staggering TV rights deal. One British lawmaker even accused the clubs of living in a moral vacuum. 
We miss football. We miss the life that we had a few days ago. But now it's time to listen, to follow our scientists, doctors and nurses. You are my family football. We'll come back from this stronger, better, kinder and a little bit fatter. Stay inside, stay safe. Sound advice from a manager in one of the richest clubs in the richest football league in the world. But at a time when everyone is pulling together, the English Premier League and its stars are being accused of moral bankruptcy. That's after four top flight teams this week opted to use a British government scheme designed to help businesses survive during the coronavirus. With stars like Tottenham's Harry Kane, as well as CEO Daniel Levy reportedly each making millions in 2019, government ministers are fuming they're now being asked to cover 80% of club staff wages. Given the sacrifices that many people are making, including some of my colleagues in the NHS who've made the ultimate sacrifice of going into work and have caught the disease and have sadly died, I think the last thing, the, the first thing that Premier League footballers can do is make a contribution, take a pay cut and play their part. This stands in stark contrast with some of the biggest clubs in Europe after Barcelona's entire squad took a 70% pay cut to support 430 non-playing staff. While in Germany, four Bundesliga teams created a fund to help other struggling clubs. And Italy's Juventus stars, including Cristiano Ronaldo, agreed a four-month reduction to save the club $99 million. Here in the UK, as football authorities meet to decide how to share the financial burdens imposed by the coronavirus, the clock is ticking on their reputation. Yes, they get paid a lot of money, but I'm sure um, they want to help. They're consistently very good in the communities. And uh, I'm sure over the coming days that, that footballers will stand up and um, to be counted either taking pay cuts or making um, donations to charities or, or staff workers that are non-playing. Um, so I'm confident that will happen, um, but it takes time. And, and everyone here is jumping on the bandwagon. Politicians do tend to do that occasionally, especially at football's expense. So um, if I'm wrong, then I'll, I'll be uh, as critical as anybody else. Football's most lucrative league must move swiftly or face a reckoning that could be far more costly than money alone. Chukai Sports continues with more after the break. Chukai Sports. Welcome back to Chukai Sports. To cricket, Australian cricketer Pat Cummings' Indian Premier League paycheck is under threat as the coronavirus epidemic continues to wreak havoc on the sporting world. Cummins signed a $3.17 million deal to play for the Kolkata Knight Riders, a record figure for an international player. But the competition has been suspended due to the coronavirus pandemic. The pace bowler says he's working out in isolation to make sure he's ready should the IPL go ahead. Yeah, they, they obviously haven't cancelled it um, or anything like that yet. Um, it's still a bit of a holding pattern. So uh, we're in contact with uh, our teams every few days and um, every, obviously everyone's still really keen for it to all go ahead. Um, but, you know, the priority is to, to minimise risk of, you know, any spreading and everything so um yeah just a bit of a holding pattern everyone's still really you know, confident and hopeful that it'll, it'll uh, be played at some stage um but obviously um i think it's going to be pretty tight to um i think the the travel ban's still in till april 14 so i don't expect anything too soon to to happen Australian Olympic Committee President John Coates is the latest sports administrator to take a pay cut due to the effects of the coronavirus. Coates has announced he'll take a 20% cut in his consulting fee for 2020. The IOC member will take a $120,000 pay cut down to $475,000 for the year. Coates said the AOC is not immune from the financial impact of coronavirus at 2020. Tokyo Olympics have been postponed and are due to be held next year. And that ends Chukai Sports. The weather details coming up next. Chukai Sports. Chukai Sports. This weather update is proudly brought to you by Money Plus. With you always.
A look at the weather forecast for tonight and tomorrow in the southern region. Mostly fine apart from a shower or two in Port Moresby. Mostly fine weather in Daru and Popondita. Cloudy weather with a few showers in Kerama and cloudy with some showers and thunderstorms in Alotau. In the Mamasi region, cloudy with a few showers in Lei, Wewak and Vanimo. Cloudy with some rain showers in Medang. In the New Guinea Islands region, cloudy with a shower or two in Loringau, Kokopo, Rabao and Buka. Fine weather, although cloudy in Kaviang and some thundery showers in Kimbe. And in the Highlands region, a fog clearing, then fine weather in Mount Hagen. Fog clearing, then showers in Garoka, Kundiawa, Mendi and Wabeg. The weather update was proudly brought to you by Money Plus. With you always. And that's the news, sport and weather for today, Saturday, the 4th of April, 2020. On behalf of the entire MTV news team around the country, pleasant viewing. Good night.